Well, it's been a fun sermon series, I think, talking about these words that we use as Christians and what they mean and what they don't mean sometimes and new insights into those. And today we're going to talk about, perhaps for Protestants, one of the biggest words we use. And the word is Bible or the Bible. We talk about the Bible and uh, it's so important in our faith. It's such a centerpiece for who we are and what we believe. But what we believe about that Bible is wide and broad. In fact, actually, it's, it's the reason that we have so many denominations. Because we can't exactly agree on what every piece of the Bible means. And we interpret it differently and we look at it differently. And there have been different translations. And, I talk to somebody every once in a while, they always say, well, if we could just go back to the King James Version. And I wonder about that for a lot of reasons. One of the things I know that they may not know is that King James made the people that were doing the Bible work for him change things to fit his theology. And so it wasn't a direct translation. It really was the King James translation because he took and did with it what he wanted to do and made it in the way that he did. And we often do that with the Bible. I told Bob this morning, I said, I couldn't think out of an introduction for the sermon today. It was tough because I thought all week, oh, I have a great joke. And then it hit me that if you're under 60, you don't get the joke. <laughs> so I'm gonna tell it anyway. So if you're under 60, you can just relax for a minute and you can ignore the joke. But it was a story about the pastor that went to visit the family in their home and, and he, was, he came in the door and the mother looked at the little boy and she said, Oh, Johnny, the pastor's here. Run and get that book that we love to sit and read together as a family. And little Johnny took off and he came back with the Sears catalog. <laughs> Sorry if you're under 60. You can ask your parents what a catalog is. So we can talk about that. But the truth is, this idea of the Bible, it's so important. And, and I want to begin, maybe kind of like a history lesson, and uh, take a look at how the Bible came into existence. And believe it or not, there are three main theories. And when I say main, because we, we, we kind of tweak those to get where we want to go. The first one is what we would call holy dictation. And that's where God dictated right to the writers of the Bible, what to say exactly every word, they got it right, every word is the way it is, and, the, and then the books were decided. That was it. That was the books, that was from the start, that was the way it was. Another way of looking at it is something that we call imperial decree, and sometimes we're raised with that understanding, where about the time that Constantine came into Rome and made Christianity the religion of the empire, the church councils decided about the Bible. And so they, they chose what they wanted, they selected what they wanted, and left out what they didn't want. And then a theory that's been around forever, and it's one we don't like to hear in the church very much, and we hear about it every once in a while, when somebody writes a book like the Da Vinci Code or something like that, that the books of the Bible truly were written later than we thought, and not by the people that, that we thought wrote them, but by people that were impersonating them and writing what they wanted to to control the church. And the truth is that, that uh, all of these theories are out there for us. But what I want to tell you today is that the Bible and the way it came into existence was much more of a natural process. It wasn't exactly any of those ways, at least that's what we believe as United Methodists. And in a way, it was a, almost a grassroots process. Many of the books in the Bible go back to the authors right around the time of Jesus, the disciples and Paul. And so we see many of the authors in the books that are used in the Bible. That's one of the, the ways we decided what books went in. Another way we decided what books went in was that we uh, uh, accepted books that conformed to the emerging theology of the second and third centuries. And so the books fit into the theology and, and sometimes the books inform the theology and they kind of molded together, and that's how we selected some of the books. And perhaps most important in recognizing is that the books that went in the Bible were often chosen because of what I want to call longevity and utility. Otherwise, they were useful to the people in the church. The people had read them for a long time. They believed them to be important in shaping their faith. And so they've kind of emerged together. 
And it truly wasn't until the fourth century that the Bible, pretty much as we know it, began to come together and be shaped and accepted as one document. So it, it, it's a lot maybe different process than you realize. You may have thought before that somehow those books were just the books. And, and you missed the fact that there were books that when we were putting the Bible together that were left out. Later on, people like Martin Luther wondered why some books were put in. But it was a human process in putting that Bible together. And it becomes very important here for how you look at the Bible because there are folks that, that look at the Bible as everything in the Bible is literal and the Bible is inerrant and there are no mistakes and there is nothing wrong with the Bible. And there are others that look at the Bible as a document of faith, a living document where the authors of the Bible put in their faith statement into the Bible. And those are both very legitimate. But as, as the way we look at things as United Methodists, I want to say to you that, that there are three reasons, I believe, uh, good reasons for not taking the Bible as a literal, you know, as inerrant in the way it was put together, everything in it is literal. And I, I should say that, that and this, there may be a fourth one, and the fourth one is, I've never met anybody that's a biblical literalist. Have you? I haven't. We're only literal about the parts we want to be literal about. And that's the kind of literalist I've met over the years. And so I begin to look at it, and I think there are three really good reasons. The first is, this may shock you, but nowhere in the Bible does the Bible say that it's inerrant and literal. In fact, that phrase inerrancy about the Bible didn't come into existence until the 19th century. The 19th century, 1,500 years after the Bible was put together. And you know why that word came into existence? Because churches were arguing about the importance of the Bible. That really probably doesn't shock you, does it? The churches were disagreeing and arguing, so some of them decided, well, the Bible's inerrant. And so it's going to be just this way. So that's the first thing I want you to know. I think more importantly for me, when you read the Bible literally, it destroys the witness of the Bible itself. You see, because when you have to read it literally, then you have to explain away inconsistencies. Because there are inconsistencies in the Bible. Did you know that? I mean, for one thing, I can give you one quick one. There are two different stories of the way Judas died. In the Bible, look it up. They're in there. That's one of the things that you should you dig into. There are other inconsistencies in the Bible, in, 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 in kind of chronology of Jesus' ministry, in the different stories of the Gospels. And so, so I want you to know that to me, what makes the Bible so important, what makes the Bible so significant, is that we didn't edit any of that stuff out. We didn't take any of those things out. We couldn't. We could have if this was a falsehood, but we didn't. The witness of the Bible is that it reflects the faith of the writers. It affects their, you know, it reflects their beliefs. It allows us to know that these people understand who God is. They would have never understood that any of us thought they might be recording history. Because those kind of ways of looking at things didn't even truly begin to develop until the Enlightenment. And so they, were, they weren't trying to prove anything to us. They were trying to witness to their faith. And the Bible is the witness to people's faith. It's, it's the best description of who God is through the words of people that experience God's presence. And so that's the second thing I would say. The third thing is, you know, it, it, I mean, a piece of this is that if it's literal, then we must reconcile all these inconsistencies. If it's a confession of faith, then it just doesn't matter. And as I said earlier, the, the third key factor here is that, that most Christians across history have never taken the Bible to be literal. Again, that started about 150 years ago, and I only tell you that I could, I could cite 50 theologians, some of whom you would know, some of you who you wouldn't know, that would agree that, that it's not a literal document, but I will go to one that many people know, Augustine, or maybe you say Augustine. But he said that, that he didn't believe that, that those stories, so many stories were literal. They were expressions of faith to tell us who God was. They were spiritual stories. And I think if everything has to be literal, it, it limits the witness of the Bible. 
Perhaps my favorite was Karl Barth, maybe one of the great theologians of the 20th century, who said, I take the Bible too seriously to read it literally. And I feel the same way. The Bible is, is so important to me. I read the Bible each day. I reflect in the Bible each day. As that psalm that we sang, the word in the Bible is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. And I feel God's presence speaking to me through those scriptures. So historically, how do we look at the Bible? Well, I want to go back to John Wesley, because John Wesley was the founder of Methodism, not the Methodist Church, but Methodism. And Wesley was often called a man of one book. And that, that was the Bible, and that's important because it's critical to understanding Wesley and to understanding Methodism. Now, what's important is to understand that Wesley was very widely read. He didn't just take the Bible and just say, oh, this is it, I can understand it all just the way it is. He read history and science and literature, and he chastised pastors that he worked with if they didn't do that. But what he meant was that, that the primary text for him was the Bible because it brought him closest to God. He was a man of one book, and that's the way that, that led everything else that happened in his life. He began with the Bible, and that's so extremely important. He also used helps in understanding the Bible, resources that are out there, resources we have so many of today, commentaries and the way we can look and see what other people have said about those texts. Wesley also believed that the Bible had to be understood in the community of faith. And it's so, so true, because it's, it's as a community that we go forward in understanding what we believe about the scriptures. He also said, believe that in the Bible there was this overarching rule of faith. And, and, and so when you have in passages that were like tough to understand, that you would start, first start saying, does it fit in with these main themes of the Bible, the rule of faith? Because if it doesn't, I'm probably misunderstanding it, or perhaps it wasn't written in a way that, that we should understand it today. Because that's one of the things that Wesley understood, the Bible changed over time. And when you take the Bible literally, how do you deal with some of these tough issues? Like slavery. The Bible approves of slavery. And so how do you do that? And Wesley said, well, I have to fit it into these, the way the main themes of the Bible, and that was more tied to the time they lived in, not to today. And so we begin to understand that. And we believe the same thing about women in the church, don't we? Because we believe that it's okay for women to speak in church. There's occasionally there's some I would like that wouldn't, but they do anyway. So, oh, boy, I've got to keep, be careful now. So I'm too close to the choir. I might get in trouble. But seriously, we've understood that that was from then, and there's a different thing now, and that's what Wesley said. You have to understand the overarching thing. But Wesley also believed that there was a core in the Bible. There was a passage or a book that Wesley preached on more than he did any other book in the Bible, and it was 1 John. And 1 John is about a lot of things, but it's mostly about the principle of love. And so Wesley preaches about that a lot, you know, that God loved us first. That's what it says. God loved us first so that we know how to love. And, and you can't say you love God who you don't see if you don't love others who you do see. And so Wesley said, this is the core. I'm going to hold everything else up to this. And if it doesn't fit into that love principle, then I missed it. There must be something wrong. And so he reflected every. That was the lens that he read Scripture through. Looking at understanding that God is love. And that's so important. As Methodists, we've kind of taken that down to what we call the Wesley Quadrilateral. And if you can see it, many of you can't, we have this huge quilt on the wall here that was made in honor of our 100th anniversary about 20 years ago, as so we're 120 years old now. And in each corner of that, you'll see a piece of what we call the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. It's how we understand uh, life and faith. And it begins, in fact, I, I don't want to get in any trouble, but, it, but if I was making that quilt today, I would have put scripture at the top <laughs> and not at the bottom, because that's where Wesley began. Made of one book. And so you begin by looking at scripture, but in our understanding, then you look at scripture according to those other three pieces, 
which are tradition. What does the church tradition say? What does our Christian experience tell us? You know, the Pope just got a little bit of trouble, you know, for that. His Christian experience was that, that he believes that atheists that do good deeds, you know, are going to receive the blessing of Christ. He got in trouble for that, but he looked at tradition and then experience and said, I've experienced this. I know atheists that are good people. And that's what the Pope said. And the final one is reason. And I want to tell you that about Wesley. By the way, going back to Wesley, you should know that when Wesley looked at Scripture, he believed that interpretations of Scripture should always put together Scripture and what science has taught us about the world. You may not have realized that about Wesley. But Wesley said if we're learning something from science, then, then we have to reconcile that with the Scripture because science is, is telling us a lot of things about the natural world we didn't know before. So in Methodism, we look at that Wesley quadrilateral. We believe it's in community. And we look at context of the scripture, we look at studies of the scripture, we look at what it meant historically, we look at all of those things in understanding scripture. And so, whoo, boy, that's a lot. This is, this is more like a teaching lesson than a sermon today, because it's a lot to fit in there. But I want to say to you, it's so significant, because for me personally, the Bible is where I begin. The Bible is, is one of those things that I understand it to be, but we have to be careful with the Bible. We have to be careful. Because one of the things we have to know as we look at this Bible up here, that the Bible is about God. The Bible tells us about Jesus. The Bible tells us about the Trinity. But the Bible is not God. The Bible is not the Trinity. The Bible is one way of us learning more and experiencing God more. And so we must be careful that we never worship the Bible. But we worship the one who the Bible talks about. Because the truth is, the Word of God is not the Bible. The Word of God with the, with the capitalized W is Jesus. The Bible itself tells us that. Where? John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Bible is a way to direct us to God. It's the way that God speaks to us. It's not who or what we worship. And I think if we could perhaps go back to Wesley, maybe that's the way to go. When we're looking at Scripture and it's tough to reconcile, or it's tough to reconcile with science, or what we're experiencing, people around us, just like the Pope just had, when it's tough, maybe we can find that lens that Wesley looked through. That lens of love. You know, I hear people say that occasionally about my preaching, by the way. You know, they said, you know, he seems to preach on love a lot. Maybe I'm Wesleyan. Because I believe Jesus said it too. When Jesus said all of the scriptures come down to this, love God, love neighbor. So if you're not looking at the world in that way, if you're not looking at scripture that way, maybe you need to put on the Wesley lens, or maybe we should just call it the Jesus lens, because it's the way Jesus looked at it. Jesus looked with love. Jesus treated individuals above principles. Jesus treated everybody according to what they needed, and he, and he went with them, and he gave them love to change their lives. And so today, as I wrap up my part in this sermon series today, as We've looked at these great understandings of these words from the Christian faith. I want to reiterate to you that the Bible is extremely important and vital in our faith. It's the best way we have of understanding God. But the Bible must be looked at through lens. And the lens that Wesley chose, and the lens that Jesus chose, and the lens that I'm choosing, and you can choose your own, is the lens of love. And remember, God so loved the world. Don't ever forget that. Thanks be to God. Amen.